Popcorn junkies. Yeah, it's little old me, all on my own. That's the way to do it. Or maybe that's not the way to do it. Yes, we're reviewing, or I'm reviewing, Judy and Punch, which I went to see uh, in the middle of an enormous row with my wife. Not the greatest of films to see in the middle of a row with your wife. Uh, Judy and Punch. It's actually directed by an Australian actress called Mira Fawkes. I believe she's been in films like um, Animal Kingdom, Sleeping Beauty, and she's written and directed this, which is no mean feat. It's been at the Sundance Film Festival, so it's her directorial debut. It stars Mia Wozikowska. Um, we'd probably, mainstream audiences would probably know her best for uh, Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. Uh, and it also stars Damon Herriman, who um, we will probably all recognise more immediately from as being uh, Charles Manson in Quentin Tarantino's recent Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I think he had two scenes in which he said, I think nothing. Um, and he has talked a lot about the fact that one of the greatest scenes ever written by Tarantino was a scene in which he had a lot of lines, but it was cut. So this is clearly an inversion of the idea of the Punch and Judy show. I mean, if you don't know what Punch and Judy is in the UK, it's a show usually associated with seaside towns where a character called Punch punches and hits his wife Judy with a stick. Um, they throw the baby around, uh, there's an alligator crocodile involved at certain times. Um, it's very violent, but it's it's puppetry. Um, and this film kind of, you know, the premise of this film, when we all watched the trailers variously, we all thought it was a very exciting one. It looked like a very intriguing, very kooky, very odd, very sort of left field. You know, sometimes, you know, Australia and New Zealand can deliver some really left field, under the radar kind of curiosities when it comes to sort of slightly avant-garde, slightly strange, quite sort of, you know, like Animal Kingdom and the films of Taika Waititi, a classic example. But this is a film that reframes the Punch and Judy show obviously flipping the names around to Judy and Punch, so giving priority to Judy, which kind of earmarks the fact and the idea that this film is going to be pretty much taking things from her POV in terms of certainly sympathy. So yeah, a number of the reviews have sort of said this is set in a 17th century England in a town, very wittily, is it witty? I can't work out if it is witty, called Seaside. Because let's face it, that's where Punch and Judy shows were always happening in the UK, at the seaside. Uh, I don't necessarily know if it is 17th century. I think what I like about this film is the way in which it purposefully doesn't make clear sort of when it was. I mean, obviously, it's in a sort of... It's a bit Shakespearean, it's a bit Dickensian, it's a bit Game of Thronesy. It's kind of generic and specific. It's very much in a sort of English sensibility. And if you think about it, Punch and Judy was an English thing. So, um, you know, it's clearly there. It's a film about... Well, I mean, I suppose it is a film about domestic abuse. It's a film that's being touted by the critics as the sort of first film or a, f a film that tackles the whole hashtag Me Too uh, issue and, and, and themes coming out of the hashtag Me Too um, movement. And, and in, to that extent, insofar as it, it tries to put, you know, a magnifying glass over the inherent domestic abuse of Punch and Judy, it sort of reframes all of the violence of the Punch and Judy show into the real lives of the uh, Mia Wozikowska's and Damon Herriman's characters. They are obviously called Judy and Punch. And so it's a film about him. Punch is a man who's struggling with alcohol. And I thought at the beginning of the film there was a really tender and quite clever scene where you you saw a man not wanting to drink and not wanting to be or fall foul or fall victim to his alcoholism, but within a community which was Rabelaisian and bawdy and full of sort of, you know, overflowing jugs of, of ale and, you know, and cleavage clad women and the sense of a brothel being everywhere and everyone sort of, you know, spilling, everything spilling out and everything burgeoning all too much, all too sort of sensory and indulgent and vice-like. So the idea that this man, Punch, was in any way going to stay sober within this community, uh, you know, he's on a hiding to nothing. Now, one of the things that we were charmed by when we saw the trailer for this film was it's apparent balance of slapstick with really dark gallows 
twisted sort of humour, almost a sort of torturous humour, a sort of, I don't know, reformation comedy type horror, you know, the idea that, you know, violence and killing people and torture and death and execution. I mean, one of the things that I thought was really good about this film was the way in which it situates execution and the act of execution and the show of execution as really a sort of 17th century or medieval uh, equivalent to watching television, or, or watching a box set or going to the cinema. And so there was this sense of, you know, executions, you know, the mob, the 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 majority, the, the crowd, the rabble rousers, the, the, the all, all the citizens of this city being sort of mobilized around, you know, one man who says, let's stone them and another person saying, let's hang them. And, and, and so, you know, it's a good film about all those issues of mob mentality versus the individual and how does the individual survive within this. And you see that even Punch, who becomes an incredibly reproachable and reprehensible character as the film progresses. I mean, you don't get much worse than what he does. Um, you know, even he, even if he wanted to try and become an individual who didn't drink, you know, everything around him was geared and structured to prevent him from being able to do that. There was also the added difficulty, if you like, or bonus stroke difficulty, that they are, because they put on this stage show, that, you know, they're both responsible, Punch and Judy, for putting on their own Punch and Judy show. And it's a sort of success and it's a, a draw, it's a crowd pleaser at the local tavern. And to that extent, uh, Punch, played by Damon Herriman, is something of a local hero. He's, you know, people see them as, they're quite starry, they've got a sort of minor celebrity kind of feel to them. Um, but meanwhile, Judy, obviously played by Mia, is is having to negotiate both being the sort of really the the Svengali and the brain behind the success of the show. Uh, she's also got a baby that she's bringing up and she's running the home. Um, and so you quite quickly get to a place where she can't control her husband's drinking, Punch's drinking. And of course, one thing leads to another and a little bit like the seaside Punch and Judy show, he hits her and he assumes He's killed her. But that doesn't happen until after probably one of the film's most shocking moments because the kind of pinch point or crunch point that brings Judy and Punch into proper conflict is what's happened to baby. Well, all I'll say to you is if you're familiar with Punch and Judy shows, what generally happens to the baby in a Punch and Judy show? Hmm? That's right. The baby usually is thrown or flies through the air. And I think for anyone of a nervous or sensitive disposition, I was shocked by a scene, spoiler alert, of the baby being accidentally dropped and then thrown and flying out of a window. You see it happen. Not a lot is left to the imagination. I mean, you don't see the aftermath. But it's quite arresting and it's quite dramatic. And in a weird way, it's the one moment in this film that really really stands out as quite radical and dangerous and edgy because the rest of the film and this is my point whilst it has all these other elements of being a bit kooky being a bit odd a bit of slapstick a bit of darkness the slapstick tended to tug against the sense of how actually horrible most people's lives were in this village so you had you know yeah okay there's all that fun and jauntiness around sort of let's go oh, it's stoning day it's national stoning day and all that kind of stuff that's kind of funny a bit but it doesn't really hit its target it doesn't know whether it's full monty python or whether it's done Dark, slightly Lynchian sort of, it reminded me at times of a film by Neil Jordan called Company of Wolves, you know, whether it was a bit more mystical and a bit more avant-garde and then it would go slapstick. So that was its kind of, I felt the, the baby throwing moment was a kind of a key and quite exciting moment. And I thought, right, this is gonna get fascinating. We're gonna, it's willing to go to places that a lot of films aren't willing to go to. And then what seemed to happen to the film was the second half of the film, Mia Wasikowska's character is, he believes he's killed his wife. He believes she's dead. So he goes and chucks her in the, he buries are in the wood. She's not dead. She's kind of resurrected and rescued from her grave by, and this is the part of the film that then began to push it towards sixth form filmmaking. You know, here's your theme, go and make a film six formers. And that's no disrespect to six formers because I think six formers would come up with something much better than this. But this is why what I was doing on my A-level film studies. And so you had a band of women outcasts who made camp on the outer fringes of the village or town and they were all living together in near next to harmony, looking out for each other, pulling for each other. Now, at times it reminded me of my mum's feminist meetings in the 70s and 80s. It was a nice vibe, but it was a bit too sickly sweet. It was a bit too idealist. It was a bit too on the nosed feminist kind of 
This is a Me Too, women gathering together, women helping women. Get all of that, I'm right signed up to that, but I felt it needed to be done with a lighter hand. It felt very heavy handed, felt very obvious. And then the film slipped into what becomes essentially a revenge story of Judy getting her own back. So what happens is Punch then accuses two of the kindliest people in the village of having murdered, murdered his wife and cooked and potentially eaten the baby. Patently ridiculous, but you do get this sense that the mob, the mass, the population of the village, they just want to believe this. They want the story, they want the headline, a bit like we do. We want the fake news. We prefer the headlines to the truth. Let's have the headlines, that's so much more exciting. And the kindly old gentleman and the, his wife are slammed up and they're gonna be executed because Punch has said they're the ones who did it. You've got this curious character of the cop or the sheriff in the town who's got virtually no power. And uh, you know, the ruffians are the ones that, that, that take control and sort of frame these old people to be hung. And you've got the sort of sheriff of the city who is this, again, another lone voice, an, an, an individual wanting to swim against the current. But again, his character doesn't really go anywhere. So he, you've got lots of longing shots of him thinking, oh, well, I don't really believe Punch. And oh, I don't really believe that they were gonna, they were the ones that will have killed the baby. And oh, but it doesn't really go anywhere. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really have any meaning. And then you build to this remarkable sort of final scene where essentially, you know, the execution is gonna happen uh, and then Mia Wozikowska on a horse in the distance with her outlaws like something from a sort of 17th century Mad Max with all these young kids and all women and, and, and all coming riding across on horses. It was a bit too, it was a bit too, how can you put this politically correctly? It was a bit too dungaree wearing of the 70s, happy clappy, this is how it should be. This is how we'd like it to be. Lots of women. Now, that makes me, I'm signed up to the politics of this film. I just thought it was done in a really immature, slightly childish way. And it was a bit obvious. And there were many scenes of sort of straight explication where female children in the group of outlawed women would explain what they felt and what they wanted and so the message wasn't sort of there wasn't a the message wasn't beneath the surface the message was bam in your face and it was all a bit too obvious what about the technicalities of the film i thought the camera work at times was good the scene and set de set design was good i did feel the limitations of the village i felt like we had a few sort of views and vantage points and so it didn't feel as vast or as believable i mean i guess they didn't have enough budget for any cgi or kind of but the, it seemed quite claustrophobic i mean villages were back in these days um the camera work at times felt inventive. I think I think if there was anything I really did like about the film, there was a sort of sepia toned lack of light to many scenes and I quite like that sort of oranges and quite autumnal colours. The music was interesting. At times it would sort of contort from sort of period music into modern variants. I can't remember the tunes but modern variants and quite contemporary tunes and you'd have a bit of synthesizer in there at times. Sort of, I guess, the director trying to remind us that the, the themes and topics coming up in this sort of hashtag me to uh, tracked uh, have a relevance to now and that this isn't just a pocket of, of or a moment in time back then um, so that, that, that was quite neat I mean there were flourishes there were definite flourishes at the edges I thought the first 20 to 30 minutes of the film were very tight up until really up until baby flies and uh, Judy is thought to have been killed by punch I thought I thought it was quite tight and then it started to sort of degenerate into needing to find more overarching reasons reasons to justify being a film and then justify having the new scenes and it became a little bit repetitious. Um, as I say, the comedy didn't always hit. I mean, I don't even think, did I laugh out loud? No, I gasped out loud at the baby scene, but I didn't really laugh out loud at any of the sort of slapstick or caricatured performances of the villagers. That said, Mia Wozikowska, as ever, I think she's always a very, very safe pair of hands and she was pretty sturdy at the centre of this. Uh, Damon Herriman, as I say, was very good too. They were both giving it their all. So I think if you had a, you know, if you had a, a Friday night, you see it on I, iPlayer, Apple TV or something, and you fancy a, you know, for $3.99 you can rent it, i check it out. I, I was overarchingly disappointed by this film though. I thought it was going to be a much more sophisticated film with a cleverer message and that the message wasn't going to be literally banged into my eyes or worn as a great big badge on a pair of pink dungarees directly out of the 70s. That's what it felt like. You know, I felt like feminist filmmaking can be far more sophisticated than this. And I just felt the message was too obvious, too straight and too, 
too gloopy, too gloopy, so that it ended up becoming dismissible. I liked the idea of using the parallel of Punch and Judy. I liked interrogating the concept behind Punch and Judy. I mean, what kind of a culture do we have that generates a, a, a seaside resort show that's essentially glorified domestic abuse? I mean, you know, let's interrogate that. And I, I, you could argue that this film looks at that, but it looked at it in too obvious, too direct, too unsubtle a way, really, for me. Yeah, I wasn't challenged in terms of the filmmaking. It just felt a bit boom, boom, boom. And, and at times, some of the scenes just got too long and a little bit boring towards the end. I don't normally score when I do these reviews on my own, but I would probably give this, if I had to give it a, a score, I would give this a four out of 10. For more film and family fun, don't forget to click the subscribe button and make sure to click the bell to never miss an update.